Hey everybody, it's Retro DM Ray back with you again for the channel. Um, today I am back again in the Role Playing Game Primer and Old School Playbook by P Chris Gonerman. And uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. Again, if you like this content, like, subscribe, click the bell icon so you get notified uh, when I upload new videos. Um, share with others. Remember, this is always a G-rated channel, uh, so don't post any, any nasty stuff because I'll delete that. I won't be political. I won't be social commentary. We won't go there in any way. Um, this is not really for profit. This is for fun. Um, I do have a Patreon. If you do want to support me, um, you can a little bit. If you want to go through Drive Through RPG, um, I am an affiliate there. You could get some stuff there, and I make a, a few cents off of that, but not much. Um, it's just to. Uh, to be able to purchase more uh, gaming uh, stuff so that I can present it on the channel. Um, but ultimately, I'm, this is not about money. This is about my love of the hobby of old school D&D uh, &D and uh, other role-playing games. All right, so let's get back into our read again. Remember, we are in the back-and-forth um, fictional commentary that Chris, um, the author here, is having with his uh, new players. And so now we are in... Um, the section on page 10, starting on page 10, entitled Into the Tunnel. Uh, in parentheses, to start, a few minutes later, everyone has purchased equipment and written it down on their character sheets. Chris, the man leads you to his house. Along the way, he tells you his name is Bertram and that he's a journeyman leather worker. His home is a small place in the poorer part of town. When you get there, he introduces you to his wife, Tilla. She's too beside herself with grief to speak to you. Joe, so where's the tunnel? Raneth has a new battle axe and he's itching to try it out. Chris, Bertram leads you to his cellar. It's dark and the ceiling is so low that Raneth bumps his head. Sandy, Eleanor is something like three feet tall, right? Uh, so I'm safe? Chris, Bertram points out the tunnel to you. It's narrow and low, just big enough for Raneth to crawl through. Joe, ugh. Crawling into a dark hole doesn't sound like a good idea. Sandy, can Eleanor walk into it? Chris, yes, it's a good size for her. Sandy, I'll scout ahead then. Chris, it's dark in there, and the only one of you who can see in the dark is Valdorian the elf. Mike, hey, I'm not going first. Sandy, relax, elf, I've got this. I pull out a torch out of my backpack and light it, and then I'll walk into the tunnel. Eleanor can move silently, right? Chris, yes, a first-level thief has a 25% chance to do that. Sandy, okay, so how do I roll for that? Chris, when you need to make a roll against a percent chance, you roll percentile dice. That's two ten-sided dice. One is marked in tens and one is in ones. And you roll them both and add them together. Sometimes you just have dice numbered from zero to nine. You choose one to multiply by ten. It helps if they aren't the same color. If you roll two zeros, the result is 100. Sandy, okay, so I roll these two here. Chris, hold on a moment, though. If you're going... If you're going to be rolling to move silently and you fail, you'll know Eleanor isn't being quiet. Sometimes in real life you think you're succeeding when you're not, you know? So whenever your character wouldn't know if he or she is successful or not, I roll the dice for you. Rolling. Okay, so moving as quietly as she can, Eleanor walks into the tunnel, torch held out in front of her. It slopes down sharply, and she goes about 10 or 15 paces before she sees the end of the tunnel. It looks like it opens into a good-sized room and it looks empty as far as Eleanor can see from inside the tunnel, anyway. Sandy, I'll go ahead and walk into the room, quietly, of course. Chris, of course. The room is 30 feet square. The walls, floor, and ceiling are stone. There are two doors here, one centered on the wall across from you and one centered in the wall to your left. There's a large pile of dirt and rubble on either side of the tunnel opening and a trail of muddy footprints leading to the left-hand door. Sandy, footprints? What do they look like? Chris, they are prints of bare feet, small, like children. Sandy, or halflings, maybe. Or maybe something else. Mike, guys, we probably need to make a map, or we'll get lost in these tunnels. Chris, here's a sheet of paper. I suggest you draw the room in the middle of the map at a scale of one square equals ten feet. So that's three squares by three squares, right? Mike says. Chris, exactly. Let me show you. There's a traditional way we draw doors on dungeon maps, and no, I don't know why we draw them this way. Sandy, okay, so the room is empty, right? Chris, looks that way. Joe, hey, we're going to follow her down. I'll crawl in first, okay? Mike, sounds good to me. The wizard never goes in first. Sandy, before they get here, I'll sneak over to the door and let 
to the left and listen to it. There might be someone on the other side. Chris, rolling dice. You don't hear anything. Sandy, then I'll listen at the other door. Chris, as you're about to put your ear to the other door, it opens suddenly and you find yourself facing four ugly little men. Their skin is greenish, their ears are big and pointed, and they have spears pointed at you. Sandy, oops. Have Joe and Mike gotten into the room yet? Chris, glancing over her shoulder, Eleanor sees Raneth just coming out of the tunnel. Sandy, I run back and get behind him. Joe, I hit him. I hit them with my axe. Chris, well, first we need to see who gets to go first. In a combat situation, everyone rolls for initiative. Roll a six-sided dice and add your dexterity bonus. Sandy, you get to add Eleanor's dexterity bonus of plus two and an additional plus one because she's a halfling. To keep things simple for me, I'm going to roll just once for all four of your opponents. Mike, what about me? Is Valdorian in the room yet? Chris, no. The tunnel is so narrow, and Joe went in front of you. Your character will arrive in the next round. You'll have to sit this one out. Joe, I rolled three. Ranith doesn't have any bonus, right? Chris, correct. He's a human with average dexterity. Sandy, I roll it with a I rolled a two. With my bonus, that's five, right? Chris, yep. I guess I better roll. Two. Now we count down the initiative numbers with the highest going first. That'd be Eleanor with a five. Sandy, great. So like I said, I run back and get behind Joe's Barbarian. Chris, I'm going to say that you're close enough to the enemy for them to attack you. So if you make a full move away from them, they have a chance to take a parting shot, quote unquote, at you. But you can make a half move without getting giving them that chance. And that's called making a, quote unquote, fighting withdrawal. Sandy, got it. How far can I move then? Chris, normally with no armor on, Eleanor can move up to 40 feet as a full movement. But since she's wearing leather armor, her movement is reduced to 30 feet. Sandy, so I can only move 15 feet without them stabbing me? Well, Joe's character is further than that, isn't he? Chris, yes, but his initiative is higher than theirs, so he'll get to move before them. In fact, it's his turn now. What will Raneth do? Joe, I run over there and hit them with my axe. Chris, Raneth moves past Eleanor. His large body effectively blocks the door, so the green guys can't, pa- get, can't get past him to attack you. Sandy, thanks, big guy. Joe, now I hit them with my axe? Chris, yes. To make an attack, you'll need your 20-sided die or d20. Joe, got it. What do I need to roll? Chris, you're trying to roll at least as high as their armor class. You don't actually know what their armor class is, so you just make the roll, add your bonuses, and tell me the total. Then I will tell you if you hit. Joe, I rolled a 12. What do I add? Chris, we start with your attack bonus. All three of your characters have the same AB attack bonus to start with. It's plus one. As your characters gain levels, the AB will go up fast for the fighter, slower for the magic user, and in the middle for the thief. Since you're using a melee weapon, you also add your strength bonus. More strength makes it easier to get past your enemy's defenses. Joe. Okay, so with Rannis plus two strength bonus, his attack bonus of plus one, that's a total of 15. Did I hit? Chris, you did. Now we need to know how much damage you did. Your battle axe does an eight-sided die of damage, so roll 1d8. Add your strength bonus to that roll as well, since hitting harder makes it hurt more. Joe, I rolled four, plus two is six. Chris, one of the monsters falls before your onslaught. Joe, yes! Chris, now the other three attack you. Since they're using spears and you are taller than they are, all three of them can reach you. Raneth is wearing chainmail, which has an armor class of 15. That's the number the monsters need to beat to hit you. I'll just make the rolls. 11, 6, 14. Joe, great, they all missed me. Chris, not so fast. The monsters have an attack bonus of plus one, so the last one got a total of a 15. Now I roll damage. Their spears do 1d6 damage. Four points. Raneth has seven points normally. Deducting four leaves him with three. Joe, so one more hit could kill me? Chris, yep. So everyone has acted. Let's roll initiative for the next round. Don't forget to add your bonuses. Mike, you're in the fight this round. Sandy, one plus three is four. Joe, I got six. Mike, four. Chris, and the monsters have a five. Joe, you're up first. Joe, I hit them. Mike and Sandy, with my axe. Joe, yeah, I rolled a nine, plus three is 12. Do I hit? Chris, no, sorry, you missed this time. Now they get to attack you. 16, two, three. One hit for 1d6 points of damage, it's a two. Raneth has one hit point left. Joe, oh crap. Mike, don't worry, I've got this. It's my turn, right? Valdorian casts his sleep spell on them. 
Chris, the monsters have a chance to resist your spell. It's called a saving throw. I'll explain it more when you need to make one of your own. Wait a moment while I roll this. Okay, two of them fell asleep and one didn't. The one who's left suddenly feels a little outnumbered and turns to run away. This gives Ranath a chance at a parting shot. Go ahead, Joe, and roll an attack. Joe, um, I rolled a one plus three is four. Chris, you missed. Just so you know, no matter how good your bonuses or how good the enemy's armor class, a natural roll of one is always a miss, and a natural 20 is always a hit. Mike, natural roll? Chris, the number on the die is the natural roll. Mike, oh, the number without bonuses. Chris, exactly. Since Ranith missed, the monster gets away, leaving one dead and two sleeping. Joe, we should kill the sleeping ones. Sandy, wait, they might know where the kids are. They're the right size for that tunnel, aren't they? Chris, it certainly looks that way. They're little guys about the size of Eleanor. Sandy, so I tie them up. I've got some rope in my backpack. Joe, Ranith will stand guard. Questioning prisoners doesn't sound like something he'd be good at. Mike, I'll help Eleanor tie them up. Do I have to wait for the spell to wear off or something? Chris, no, you can wake them with a slap or two or throw some water on them. Mike, I'm not wasting water. I wake one up with a slap to the face. Chris, he wakes up and begins chattering in an unfamiliar language. It's not the common language of humans, nor is it the language of halflings or of elves. Mike, hey, wait, Valdorian is pretty smart. Does he know any other languages? Chris, good call, Mike. With your intelligence bonus, you can start with one extra language besides common and elf. I'll tell you what, if you want, you can speak their language. Mike, sure, okay. Chris, these monsters are goblins, and they are begging for mercy. Mike, that's more like it. Valdorian asks them where the children are. Chris, one goblin looks at you with fear in his eyes and says, We gave them to the ogre. He told us he'd kill and eat us if we didn't get him some children to eat. Please don't kill us. Sandy, an ogre? What's that? Chris, a humanoid monster, much bigger than a man, strong but not very smart, and usually pretty evil. Sandy, well, duh, he wants to eat children. Mike, if he's, got a, if he's a lot bigger than these guys, he'll kill us. I mean, Joe is down to his last hit point, and I've used my only spell. Sandy, we don't have to kill him, Mike. We just have to trick him. Remember? Not very smart. The adventure goes on. Hopefully this example of play has helped you to see how role-playing games are played. In the next part, I'm going to give you some tips on how to play the game better. I'm aiming my tips at beginners, but with any luck, even more experienced players might learn something useful. All right. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this particular section of the book today from Chris. Um, I want you to take notice of how the way old school play works. A lot of uh, upfront descriptive and then a lot of character interaction and questions for the dungeon master. Um, there's not a lot of all of this extraneous stuff, and there's not a lot of, so what is everything all built already into my sheet that I can look down and reference and try to ask to roll, rather than I just want to ask questions about what it is I just heard, what it is I just saw as my character, um, and those type of things. And it's investigating those surroundings, investigating that uh, descriptive uh, data that that the dungeon master has passed on. And then it's the social contract that the DM has fiat to do that, um, control to do that, um, and that the players have the ability to ask those questions and they can trust that the dungeon master is going to give them accurate information um, and then call for them to make accurate roles. And I want you to notice, too, about the secret role thing. And that's, a, that's kind of a big deal with some systems and people have problems with that. Um, again, that social contact contract and that trust was that the dungeon master says, hey, look, in the real world, um, in, in, in the example in the book, in the real world, you think you're sneaking quietly, but you don't really know that. So I'm going to roll it behind here, and then I'm going to give you some descriptive information, but you don't actually know whether you are or not. You won't know that unless someone else hears you and reacts to that, or they don't. I think that's very, very important. And in, in some ways, and this may not work at your table this way, um, this may not work in your games as the, in this particular way, and that's fine, that's cool. Um, but in some games, there's a built-in sense of the, the game 
kind of makes you speak in game system terminology and not in this very casual, open, question and answer, uh, investigative, creative way. Um, instead, it makes you crunch a bunch of things together, pile a bunch of things together, and then what I call, then begin to game system speak. Um, or character sheets speak. If you've seen any of my past, listen to any of my past videos. Um, again, if this if this doesn't work this way at your table, um, that's cool. You play whatever you're going to play and whatever ha you have fun with at you at your guys' table, um, however you see fit. That's totally cool. This just happens to be the way in which I first learned, the way in which I love. Um, of course, not with this more modern D20 approach system. It was with BX. Um, and then after BX was immediately Mensa Basic right around that same time. And right around that same time was then also first edition Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons. Um, and then second edition and onward from there. Um, but that's just this is just the way that we played. We didn't know any different. Um, and although you might say we didn't know any better... Um, I think it's good that we didn't know any better because I don't think it's I don't think it's better uh, in my personal opinion. Again, this is just my humble personal opinion. Um, if you don't agree with it, that is totally cool. Um, I just appreciate that you have tuned in um, and that you tune in every time that you're subscribing. Um, you're getting notified. You're sharing with others. I appreciate all of your G-rated comments. I appreciate all of your thoughts towards the channel. Um, share it with others. Um, I've had some comments uh, uh, over the course of the channel that my channel seems to be rather rare uh, because I don't use language and I don't have any or allow any any nasty stuff on here. So it's it's able to be listened to by kids. Um, I'm not an audiobook reader in any way, shape or form. Um, so uh, I'm just trying to read through this to help us understand it and enjoy it together. Again, go to Amazon, pick up this five six dollar book for yourself it's a wonderful read it's something that your kids could easily read it's just a great way to get introduced to um, the old school way of playing D D and other tabletop role playing games um, thanks again for tuning in and as i always say at the end of all of my videos may all of your roles in your gaming be nat 20s take care